Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining me to review the papers is G.D. Johnson as a public affairs analyst. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you, Roma, and good morning to our viewers all over the world. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, so we'll be starting with The Guardian this morning, and it talks about one year of renewed hope. Now, we know that the President Bala Hamed Tinubu's administration has been in office for almost a year. In fact, in about five days, they will be marking one year in office. And this one on The Guardian leads with Tinubu's costly reforms leave Nigerians on edge one year after. Um, I know that the first reform was just on that same day, May 29, 2023, and he just says a subsidy is gone, even though we knew that subsidy was not supposed to be gone till about June. And that proclamation on May 29, you know, just became a catalyst to so many other things. Now, we've seen subsidy being gone, which is like the petroleum sector. We've also seen electricity tariff, which is in the energy sector or power sector. Um, they also tried to introduce the cybersecurity levy as well, financial. And then we also hear that the VAT might also be increased. And so we're seeing a lot of reforms. Um, we're seeing a lot of policies. But do you agree with what the Guardian is saying this morning, that Tinobu's costly reforms leave Nigerians on edge one year after? One thing that is very clear is that the administration was in a hurry to set the ball rolling mm. without doing due diligence. And we said it over time in many of the programs we've had. Um, without doing due diligence <coughs> with respect to what is the state of the economy, what is the state of the polity, and what is the state of the, um, the civil service they are inheriting from the previous administration. I don't forget that the president himself has not been in government since 2007, and he hasn't done anything meaningful, specifically either being the chairman of a board or getting involved in one activity or the other, or going back to school to equip himself. Aside from being the governor of Lagos State from 1999 to 2007, after I left office, there's nothing and that we can actually point to on public record, let me put that caveat that the president um, did between that time period until he took over a year ago. So it was more or less like in a hurry to set the ball rolling. And we, 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 we advise that government should tread on caution, having an understanding of what the economy is before coming out with this policy. And it's very clear that the policy that this administration embarked upon economically is about revenue generation and not about building the economy because everything was about uh, removing sub removal of subsidy um, in bringing different forms of taxation and the rest of it had been the direction with which the government embarked upon and it has a corresponding effect on the entire economy on the cost of living on the standard of living on the exchange rate of the naira compared to the dollar because if your currency is not a productive economy if it's just a purchasing economy, it will be subjected to the whims and the caprices of the market forces. And Naira is just a purchasing um, purchasing currency, is not a productive currency because there's nothing that 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 Nigeria is producing and exporting to other countries other, other than we importing things from other countries. So it was evidently clear. Uh, it was evidently clear that there's no doubt that this policy will lead us to a quagmire. And that's a quagmire in which we have found we have found ourselves. Uh, and it's unfortunate that um, they are just coming to terms with some of the reality of time. We don't know because the government has not come out to tell us whether they are paying subsidy or they are not paying subsidy. But from what from fillers that we have gotten from from international agencies, is that government is still paying subsidy somehow. And then if you are still paying subsidy, why are we paying six hundred? Last week I bought for seven hundred and fifty naira. Per liter. And, um, and if the government is still subsidizing it, where is this subsidy going into? So um, the government requires, moving forward, they require transparency, transparency in the sense that there should be regular briefing with respect to what the government is doing. Um, I'm not sure that the president has done a presidential chart. One of the um, drawbacks of the of the EPC administration at the center in the last 
now he is that their inability not to connect with the people using the platform provided by the presidential chat with the PDP administration of Abbasan Joe, yeah, Do and Jonathan exploited regularly interfacing with Nigerians and then being, being, being questioned by journalists for them to know the policy trust and the policy direction of that of the administration. I think moving forward, this administration should do that. Uh, but in any case, we hope for the best. Um, we we'll always hope for the best. Um, there's another story here. It says ministers give Tinubu pass mark amid rising inflation, subsidies, insecurity. So um, we've seen inflation at an all-time high. It's about 33.7% right now. Even as of February, it was still less than 30%. But you're seeing this jump. Um, in this whole hyperinflation um, of subsidies obviously being gone. Insecurity is on a rise because you keep hearing of kidnapping, terrorism, even as of our children, um, little kids in schools are being kidnapped. Um, floating of the Naira, let's talk about the FX. You know, the, the dollar went as high as 1,900 Naira, even almost 2,000 Naira to, per dollar. So there's a lot we can talk about that has happened in the past one year. With the ministers giving Tinubu a pass mark, if, I, if you were to score, you know, this first administration saying this is the kind of mark I would give, maybe not a pass mark like the ministers, you can probably give him a, a credit or a, a distinction even, what would your score be? Well, um, let me start with the minister uh, giving the president a pass mark. Uh, well, have you ever seen the student grading the lecturer? Mm. It's an anomaly for an, for, for an appointee of the president, evaluating the president. The appointee of the president that should be evaluated by the public and by the president. They are not, invariably, if they give the president's pass mark, they are invariably giving themselves pass mark. So someone set an exam, he set the question, he examined himself, mm. and he, he, he declared the result. So that's what we have, it's an anomaly. And sometimes these people take us to be a fool. I'm sure those that attended that press conference will have thrown that to them. On the administration, if I have to score this administration, I'll be frank with you, I'll score the administration D. As a lecturer, I'll score the administration D. Uh, I won't score the administration um, C credit, which is a pass mark. I'll, still, I'll just give the administration above 40, 45%. That's what I'll give the administration present. Um, because we have not gotten to half of what is required of their time. By the time we we get to the second year, we'll be able to do full assessment of at least we have done uh, 50 percent of the of the of the time of the time they are meant to spend in office in their first term. And if they win the election, they yeah, are required to spend it here. So for me, I was got the administration D. It's fair. Um, it's not. It's, it's not. It's not passed. It's not good. It's 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 it's, it's not very poor, but it's fair. That's what I was called the administration. <clears throat> Anyone trying to score this administration um, as 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 pass either as B or E or C is not being fair to himself. The truth must be told. Hmm. In the past, we are not meant to pander to administration. Our responsibility is to throw such light on what the administration is doing for them to know whether they are working in the right direction or they are working in the wrong direction. Uh, if you look at some of the um, filters that we got yesterday with respect to the Lagos. Calabar Coastal Road, mm -hmm. and that um, they are going to disembark on that particular project. You remember the use and cries Nigerians raised, and the one we even raised on this program with respect to demolition yes. of properties mm -hmm. in the first three kilometers of it. And um, you know, you take 10 steps forward, and and then you take 20 steps backward. That does just don't make any sense. For you, in, in, in public administration, you must talk through your policies. The, the economic implication, the political implication, the social implication, before you embark on that policy. And I think that, and that's the unfortunate thing about modern day democratic government, which has turned to purely an oligarchic government, government of the elites and the few nouveau rich, is that they assume that they have imperial power because they have the mandate, the mandate of the mandate of the people as a result of that, within that time frame in which they've been elected into the office. They are not accountable to anybody. They, 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 they are only accountable to the mandate they secured, either to the ballot boxes or to the court system. And it's not something which is peculiar to Nigeria alone. We have seen the growth of imperial 
imperial government at the executive level. We have seen a situation whereby we have replaced monarchical government and theocratic government um, with um, with an oligarchic um, democratic government who are just elected by the few. Mm. I mean, talking about having to score the president, it's it, of course there's going to be some form of bias because we are all together. So I wouldn't expect them to say anything um, less than a, than a pass. Um, I'm not sure that the common Nigerian on the streets would say, you know what, yes, the president is doing so well, or this administration is doing no, so well, no, I'm way, flourishing. The way you do this is to do a sectoral mm. analysis, sector by sector, the power sector. Yeah. The energy sector. The, ener the energy sector. Mm -hmm. So if you do a state analysis, when you break it down, and then, um, you know, I did, pu I did public administration while I was in school. I took it as, as one of the elective courses I took in the Department of Political Science in Unilag mm. while I was in Unilag. And one thing is very sure in, in, in public administration, they said the only way you make science, I can't forget Professor Oka used to tell the only way you make science of public administration is to do a comparative analysis and you do a sector by sector analysis. Mm. You can't just pull every minute. So if we do a sector by sector analysis, we do agricultural sector, how would you score? Power sector, how would you score? Um, <clears throat> the security sector, how would you score it? In actual sense, giving the administration this just being fair. It's not just trying to bring out the sledgehammer. And it's mm -hmm. very clear if you if you're objective and you do a sector by sector analysis, yeah. there's no way you score the administration fast enough. Mm. The purchasing power of the people have been reduced. Exactly. The cost of living has, has, has increased. The standard of living has dropped considerably. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I mean, you, you also mentioned something about the, the um, coastal road, Lagos to Calabar. And I remember a few weeks ago, it was being said that the, the reps were trying to probe that project. And I, I mean, since you just mentioned that, I, I, I keep wondering, how do we start something? And then all of a sudden, we say we're not doing it anymore. And imagine the amount of um, the, the livelihood of people that have just been displaced at the moment. Those were people's businesses um, along this stretch that have been demolished. So. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering how we do this in Nigeria and the kind of um, reforms we just come up with and say this is what we want to do and we never progress with it. We're always just abandoning stuff. Anyways, moving over it's to... Because, yeah. Okay. It's because we don't have a strong judicial system mm. whereby the citizenry has the capacity to take the government to court and government pay each penalty for whatever policy fit law. They, they, they embark upon the question you need to ask is why the government needs to embark on quick demolition of properties as if we are in a military regime and i've said it that these are the vestiges of military 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 regime that inherent that we inherited from military regime it's like having soldiers standing be behind the president or having police standing behind the governor these are in in, in other democratic government government the security services of of the president and 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 elected officials are not apparent. They 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 wear they wear they wear civilian uniforms and not military uniforms. So we still have the tendencies of of, of that managing our state managing our state affair. So it's, it's unfortunate. I hope we we'll learn from it, and I hope that the um, government will learn from this particular excuse. And those that are making justification for government for government destruction of of the means of livelihood of of destroying the tourism corridor of the, of the nation because they want to put infrastructure, then I hope they will learn from it. And then for me, I, I was watching one of the briefs, and then I, particularly that of the Minister of Federal, Federal Capital Territory. The, 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 the level of reductionism that we have reduced governance to in this country is, is alarming and is, 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 is unbelievable that the, the ABC of public administration is what people call achievement. What is the achievement in construction of roads, in building infrastructure? I don't know. I just, I just can't comprehend. The, the, when people want to list the achievement, just look at it from state to state, from local government to local government, to the federal government, when they will be listing the achievement, they will be listing construction of roads. <laughs> if they give you an eye that opportunity, 
mm. to be the governor of Lagos State. We just sit in the office. They bring the federal allocation. And then we get engineers to do the design, and they do design of road. And they bring. It's the ABC. It's the ABC of public administration. And somebody will be saying it that because they constructed those, that's an achievement. <coughs> it did not come about with an economic policy mm. that employed. Let's say, okay, in the last one year we have created opportunities. Yeah, job creation. To employ thirty thousand, yeah, fifty thousand people. We have created these opportunities in the business environment that has created. 5,000 SMEs. We've even trained so you, what, many people. We've trained so many people who then, sponsored a lot of students. Say, right. And they said, and then my colleagues, my colleagues in the media will not, will be clapping hands for them and will not ask them tough questions with respect to, how would you tell me that you are constructing road? Mm. Constructing roads is, 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 a, is an achievement. I think oh where we goodness. are as a nation is we do not, you know, when you lack some things, the little that you get, you have to, you know, just clap your hands, smile mm -hmm. and say, oh, yes, we commend you because we, we are lacking so much. And then to be able to motivate these people to do more, which I don't know if they, they take that as, a, as some form of motivation, um, you know, it's just for us to say, yes, um, yes, it's an achievement. But. It's quite unfortunate that we're not thinking of good policies. We're not thinking of how to enhance and improve the lives of Nigerians. Because I think that should be the, the goal. That should be what is paramount to every government official. Like, you sit down and you say, how can I think of better ideas to implement for Nigerians that I know that they would be grateful for? One. And then the, the, the future of our kids, the generation to come, would say, yes, we, we, we thank our, our parents, we thank our forefathers for taking such decisions that has impacted us all through the generations and i keep asking a question i say what is the nigerian goal where is nigeria moving forward to in the next 50 years where do we want to see nigeria in the next 100 years where do we want to see nigeria no one can really answer that question and it's quite unfortunate because why everyone is just trying to survive everyone is just trying to put their head above water so if you know, we have a Nigerian dream. We know that there is something, and we're just not going to be clapping over roads that are being constructed. We're going to be saying, yes, these are policies and these are reforms, you know, reforms that help us as Nigerians. But, I mean, let's not, let's, let's not go into that because I, I don't think today is the day for me um, ranting on national television. So let's just move over to another story. Um, this one talks about reps past bills to revert to old national anthem. And my question is, isn't this a case of misplaced priority? We're talking about, just like the things I've mentioned now, we're talking about reforms, we're talking about policies, we're talking about things that would actually, you know, help Nigerians. And the lawmakers are talking about reverting to the old national anthem, saying the one that we have currently was being introduced during the military rule. And the reason why we need to revert to the old one is to foster prosperity, progress, peace, prosperity. I don't know what that means. So I just want to get your comment on this. Well, um, since we want to revert back to the one that we inherited from the colonial administration, um, they said the one created by Nigerians crafted and designed by Nigerian, which is um, the second stanza, is a self indictment on those in leadership and also a prophetic um, declaration concerning what we want concerning this country, which in any case we don't, we, we don't render. That's a God of creation, direct our noble cause, guide our leaders right, because they always do something wrong. About you, the truth to know, in love and honesty to grow and living just and true, great lofty idea, I tend to build a nation where peace and justice reign. Now, you could see that this in the National Assembly, they don't even know the National Anthem. I'm not too sure they can recite the circumstances of the National Anthem. And those that have come up with the idea of going back to the old National Anthem, I'm not too sure they can recite the circumstances, or either they know the circumstances of the National Anthem. So if they, want to, if they want to go back to the old National Anthem, then we should go back to the old order, because the democracy they are in, the Fourth Republic they are practicing, was put in place by the military. They were put in place, but they, they, they had just come with the flimsy. Yes. It was put in place by the military. It was not put in place by another uh, civilian administration and democratic governance. So, mm. 
So I don't know. And then when we had that national anthem, we didn't practice the presidential system of government. We had the parliamentary system of government. We had unity government. And we had a parliamentary system of government with regions playing critical roles. So if we are reverting back to that, it would be nice for us to go back to pre-1960 pre constitution and then um, have the various institutions we have in the 1960s and then we are going back um, to the old order. I agree with them if you want us to go back to the old order where we have the three major regions, the western region, the eastern region, and the, and the, northern, and the northern region. And then we have a parliamentary system of government which has a fusion of the executive and the, and, 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 and the legislature. I, I, I'll be glad if they can look in, in that direction and then there will be no need for us to have a, a Senate. We just have a unicameral legislature and that makes it that makes it even easier, which reduces the cost of governance, and then which brings about devolution of power back back to the to, 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 to the region, and then we not have to six state governors. We rather have three premiers and the rest of it. So I support them in that direction. If they are looking for, if they are looking towards going backward, because sometimes going backward could mean, could mean you are making progress, and sometimes going forward could mean that you are just. Uh, you are you are not making progress. So if they are thinking in that direction, I think they should take they should they should take it to the full org of it. We should revert back to parliamentary system of government. We should get rid of the states and go back to regional government. And that's when I know they started talking about something. Mm -hmm. Other than this one, they just want to. You know, one of the things they do is to distract us to get us some mm. certain thing to to be generating social conversation and yeah. that. That we gloss over some of the their 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 ineptitude and their ineffectiveness as, as in the last in the last one years that we have we have charged them with responsibility of providing oversight function of providing laws um, making laws for the good governance of of, of of our society. But since they are feeling their responsibility, they want to distract us by bringing an issue in which we all get emotional about. And when you're emotional, you can't think straight. Yeah. I mean, so there's always that thing that it doesn't matter um, what parliament, what system of government we are, um, you know, using. It's the people. The, the government is the people. Whether we're saying we're using, you know, a presidential system of government or a parliamentary system of government, it really doesn't matter. It's the makeup of the people and the policies that they're putting in place. Now, reverting to an old anthem, I just, I'm just wondering why. Because guess what? It's just on paper. It's just, you know, when you when you're at functions you have to recite this anthem. Is it really Rumi, going I'm to sure foster peace and progress? Rumi, I'm and sure you don't know that. I'm sure you don't know that um, uh, old national anthem. Of so let me recite it. Okay, Nigeria, please do. Nigeria, we okay, okay. Mm -hmm. our own their native land, do tribe and tongue, made the fine brotherhood we stand. Nigeria are proud to serve our sovereign motherland. Now, put that side by side with the second stanza of our national anthem. Mm. Oh, God of and creation, see, direct um, our noble cause. Guide, guide our, our leaders right. right. Mm -hmm. Help our youth that truth, truth to, to know, know in love, love and, and honesty, honesty to, to grow. grow. And living just and true, great lofty height attains to build a nation where peace, where peace and justice peace reign. Shall reign. Yeah. So uh, put that side by side with the one they want to go back to, which was put in place by the colonial by, by the colonial administration as soon as we are getting our independence. I don't know, it's a misplaced priority room and you said it's exactly. misplaced. It, I don't, don't think this don't, is what we should be they discussing. Don't, they, don't, <laughs> mm, they, they know what they are doing, it's a distract. Is, mm. is a distractive strategy. They want to distract us from the main issue and begin to discuss about that. Those of us that recited that national anthem while we were in primary school, we become nostalgic about it. Mm. And those of you that did not recite that national anthem, you become nostalgic about the one you have and you have, create, you have created a debate yes. and, a, and a cultural war and a class war between different segments of the society. And then you have your distraction. And then you, you, you can go out with other Interesting things. And, and, and smart, I must say. But honestly, I don't think this is what we need to be talking about. We need to be talking about you other see things. The speed the... with which they passed it. You can see the speed with which it went through first reading, second reading, and yeah, the rest and of third it. reading as well. Mm. 
Well, let's move over to um, another one. This talks about um, the Emma of Kanu. Now, as Sanusi returns, anxiety, uncertainty in Kanu over fate of disposed of deposed emirs, emirs, and then on the daily trust, it says Sanusi returns as emir of Kanu, Bichi, Rano, Karaye, Gaia, monarch, monarchs dethroned, development, a bad omen, and being said by the northern leaders, Dan Agundi challenges action in court. What do you think about this? Um, it's been uh, several years. Um, that the Emir well, of Kanu was dethroned, and now he's been reinstated by the governor. Hello, sir. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. As the leader of the political um, spectrum and the social economic spectrum of Nigeria, um, uh, uh, for me, that this map. The visit of um, the visit of hello, can you hear me? Yes, I the can. The visit of uh, the visit of um, of um, Elijah Aminu Dantata to the president um, some days ago might not be unconnected with it. I might be wrong, but that's just my opinion. Mm. Might not be unconnected with with what happened in Kano, and um, and then the visit of the deposed um, Emir of Kano to the Ujale of 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 Ijebu land might not be unconnected with the intrigues and the power play that we saw played out um, yesterday with respect to restoration of Kanu back to his old order. As far as I'm concerned, I think that um, it's it's the same thing Ganduje did was what um, um, his, 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 his in-law of blessed memory, the former governor of Oyo State, uh, Senator Ajimobi also did with the Bados too, creating uh, breaking the Bados too, I think into 13, and Ganduji broke the Kano stool into, into into five. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, governors should not desecrate um, institutional, traditional institutions that have been in place for 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 years. Kano, we know Kano Emirate has been Kano Emirate since God knows when, and then it's not what government should double into politically. And I think the best way to bring about sanity back into that system is to restore it back to the old, to the old, to the old, to the old order. And some might not uh, be at home with it. The form, the, the Sanusi was the, was, was the post um, on flimsy excuse. And there was no justification for his, for his deposition. And then in order to justify that, the entire Kano Emirate was desecrated um, and as far as I'm concerned, what was done is, is done in the right in the in the right direction. The only way you can correct an anomaly is for you to go back to the to the to the to the old to the old to the old order. That's justice. That's that's fairness. And um, all the all the thrones that were created, the other four thrones never existed on the twenty on the twenty on the twenty <coughs> twenty twenty <coughs> on the on the twenty 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 nineteen twenty twenty. So. Um, Kano Emirate has existed for, 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 for more than six, 600 years. So why should you just wake up because you're elected as a governor and you try to desecrate, to desecrate that on political ground? Mm. So I think that as far as I'm concerned, there, are, there have been moves. My own interpretation as a public affairs analyst, the, the visit of um, Alaji Dantita to the, to the president might not be unconnected with what happened in Kano. Because I'm not too sure that the elites in Kano were really happy with what Gandhiji did with 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 the breaking down of the Kano Emirates into into five five Emirates. Mm. So I, I know that one thing we have as a people, um, you know, here in Nigeria, here in Africa, is our culture. And our culture needs to be preserved at all costs. In fact, I was having a conversation with someone and we're saying that what we have, you know, over the Western world is our culture. They don't really have as much culture like we do. And we, you, you know, we have a rich, vibrant culture. When you think of, you know, the Benin Kingdom, when you think of the Kano Emirates, you know, you think of all of this, um, you know, the Yoruba Kingdom, you think of this and it's culture. And I think it's important that we preserve that. Now, you see the British monarchy, it's been in line, you know, the succession has been in that same line for decades, years, centuries.
And I think that's what we need to do in Nigeria, making sure that we're preserving our culture instead of just coming, deposing, you know, emirates and making it, a, we're, we're turning it into a political thing whereby the kings are now, you know, being appointed by the government. Why can't the king rule or the emir or the oba or whoever it is, the ulu, why can't they just rule and it is, you know, the succession is in that same lineage not you know someone coming and appointing them and saying because i'm governor or because i'm you know this person now i can just appoint someone else so we need to preserve that culture and i think it is very important in fact it is, it is imperative um that we preserve our culture in nigeria and africa as a whole all right um so moving over to another paper we're moving over to nature news now nature news leads with Nigeria lost $5.6 billion to gas flare in eight years. And that's been said by Dr. Salako. Um, he says, fled 1.6 billion um, metric tons of gas since 2016. Released 86 million metric tons of CO2, 31 um, um, metric tons of methane. And, you know, gas flaring. Now, I know that they say we don't have... Um, so much compared to some other countries but if we're losing about 5.6 billion dollars in eight years that could have been revenue for us that could have been money um you know to do certain things in nigeria have certain infrastructure have quality education for some kids um you know even good health care but we're losing that to gas lowering shouldn't this be something we're talking about now especially having um to conserve our environment now we talk about these are the areas in which government needs to invest critical infrastructure why can't yeah. we have a situation whereby i don't even have to go to a first station to to have access to 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 cooking gas or other forms of gas that the one we use that the one we use domestically why can't government pipe it just like pipe water uh, remember there was a project i think in the in 2005 2000 2004 5 six um this west african west african gas pipeline that nigeria was trying to construct to supply gas to to the law of west africa and the rest of it well we have it in abundance and that's why we are flaring it we don't know how to to continuize it and distribute it across the length and breadth of this country and so since you don't you have not built the critical infrastructure to put those gases to commercial use that you make money from what you do is to is to flare it and which you con which contributes to 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 to, to the to environmental environmental as that creating problems for the environment and um it's not just these are the areas in which government should look at not construction of roads alone if you tell mm -hmm. me that okay you have constructed seven and something kilometers of of, of gas pipeline and i think that there's there's something going on in that direction. If you travel through Lagos about the expressway, you see um, some pipelines being 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 installed along along that along that particular corridor which is meant to to supply gas. But I think we need to to take critical step in building infrastructure that enables us to, to connect it to various homes other than flaring these gases and we make money from that. There are areas in which we can make money beyond taxation. We make money through consumption. The, 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 the productive aspect of of the economy is not is not is not is not is not through taxation. Um the telecom sector are not collecting taxes. Um those if the the, the banks are not collecting they are not collecting taxes but they make serious money because they provide services. Now, if you have a productive economy in which goods and services, product goods and services are being manufactured, from that consumption, you grow your economy, you strengthen your Naira, and then you make, you improve the standard of living, and then the cost of living is, is, is reduced, rather than for you to stifle the economy by imposing different forms of taxation on the other. These are the directions government should look at. Government should look in, in this direction. The gases even can be used to pass on some certain sector is an alternative power supply and government should look in this direction and work in this direction rather than telling us that they've constructed 700 kilometers of road <laughs> and then um, well we, uh, we, well we, uh, the president promised us about a hundred electric buses which was yet to see so yeah maybe that's another step fella sang song my try you try to do some to try to save and save but everything has been put in the reverse 
mm. government make promises <clears throat> and those promises are difficult because they're not that accountable true Okay, um, let's talk about food security because there's been some sort of food crisis in Nigeria. And then, obviously, food is very expensive. In fact, it's one of the most expensive commodities right now as of today. So, this says food security. Governor um, Namadi increases Jigawa rice output to 800,000 tons. Um, so, obviously, we, we might just be seeing a little bit more food production. But another one that interests me here says World Bank IITA, which is the International Institute um, for Tropical Agriculture, partners Niger partner Nigeria to boost food production. So what do you think? Are we going to be seeing um, a little bit more, especially with this type of partnership? And then you're seeing, you know, states like Jigawa having to, you know, boost their outputs as well. So is this going to even reduce the price? you know, of food in, in the market right now. I, I know it might not be, obviously, it's not going to be a magic wand. And then in the next few days, we're seeing the reduction. But maybe in the next couple of months, is that going to happen? Or are we going to just still ride with this thing and that gravity doesn't happen in Nigeria? So when prices go up, they just never come down. The bulk of the budget you have for the Ministry of Agriculture should not, go to, should not be centralized. In actual sense, that money should go to should go to the local government where you have the farms. The bulk of money you want to spend, I think at the at that value chain, the federal, the state, and the local. Who are those that own the land? It is not federal. It's the local government. And where are these farms domiciled? They are domiciled in the local government. And this should be the value chain that you have access to a lot of, to a lot of funding. But unfortunately, you have majority of the funding at the federal. At the federal level, so you have a lot of farmers with briefcases and without farmlands. And that's, and that's the problem which we have with the agricultural sector in Nigeria. You have a lot of farmers that have access to government credit, but without, without farmlands. And those that have farmlands don't have access to that credit. It's unfortunate. And then those um, that are, are, don't have access to that credit, and when they produce because there is high demand for what they produce, um, uh, 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 externally, so they rather export. They rather export their 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 goods and services, be package it and export it, and earn and earn money from it than for them to sell it to the local markets uh, because everything is subjected to the forces of the uh, uh, to the forces of the market. So I I don't see I don't see any impact what you are talking about. Don't we have? A, a complete 360 degree turnaround with respect to the way we take agriculture in in, in in Nigeria. Agriculture needs to come back to the local government. The bulk of it, the bulk of the revenue, the bulk of the investment, the bulk of the technical know-how should come to the local government. Why should federal government, Ministry of Agriculture, be the one having tractors or state having tractors? These tractors, what federal government should do is, okay, you know what, we are going to purchase um, um, seven or run 75 times 10 tractors. And 10 of these tractors will go to each of the local government. If you cover the 774 local government, and then we put 10 in Abuja, <coughs> you cover the 774 local government plus <coughs> the Abuja, use the Abuja as a model. <coughs> then you have covered the length and breadth of Nigeria. That means that there are 10, <coughs> there are 10 tractors that is accessible to farmers that they can, they can rent and they can hire. At, at every local government in Nigeria. But we are not doing that. We know what to do. But you know what? Because people are not interested in building legacy projects, in solving problems. People are interested in making money for themselves. So they rather go for road construction in which you do practical nothing. You get the design, you get the money, you get the contractor, you pay the contractor up front, and then Whatever you want to fleece out from that, you fleece from it, and you, you charge your rule. But if you invest in agriculture, it takes time for, for you plant, you 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 monitor it, and then you harvest. So there is there is there is a time period between your investment and then the return you get on your investment. Hmm. How so many people are interested in that? 
So even talking about, you know, your investments, return on investment, there's the headline on Business NG, and we have just about a minute on this. So it says, um, Anaira was hit foreign dependent companies hard. So a lot of people, because their, their, their businesses are dependent on the FX, obviously, the exchange rate would definitely affect them. And there's another one here that says federal government unveiled 110 billion Naira youth investment fund to boost entrepreneurship. Now, I understand that it's great to, you know, have all of this, um, you know, this, will I call it reforms or these ideas um, to say, okay, yes, we're trying to help, you know, the youth investment and all of that. But shouldn't, because some of these youths, if they're going to be entrepreneurs, um, being an entrepreneur, you never really know if you would need the FX, right? Or if you have to import certain things. So for these entrepreneurs that the, the, the government is trying to invest in, uh, fund them, wouldn't they now still get to this same point where Naira was hit for independent companies hard? So what are we doing to tackle the root cause of the matter? And not just saying, you know, we're giving out palliatives or we're trying to do this and make them look good in the public's eye. What can we do in just one minute, sir? Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, teach a man how to fish and you feed him forever. Mm. Give him a fish and you feed him for a time. The, the, the bottom line is that there is no coherent policy with respect to the policy we want to use to change our economy from being a dependent import reliant economy to a producing export reliant economy mm. um, if if you don't produce if you don't if your export does not balance your import your naira will, will, will always fall yeah. the way it's falling and there's no amount of policy you can throw money into the economy it's like two in time. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, well, I think this is just a great way to end this. We hope that, you know, they don't just throw fishes uh, to us. We hope that they're teaching us how to fish or rather, you know, they're just helping us become not just better citizens, but giving us an enabling environment to be able to do that. But this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment. Thank you so much for coming, Mr. Jide Johnson. Well, we've been sticking with Jide Johnson. He's a public affairs analyst and we've just been taking global stories, making headlines in our national dailies. We'll go on a short break and when we return, we'll be looking at a hot topic where this talks about Atiko um, saying he's always going to run for presidency. Please stay with us.